to kick off really the, the um, global burden of uh, diseases studies and spin-off publications have really been instrumental in giving us accurate estimates about viral hepatitis, about the prevalence of viral hepatitis and also about the morbidity and mortality associated with viral hepatitis. So looking here at hepatitis B, a good estimate, 248 million people who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive, and we can translate that into chronic hepatitis B, and over three quarters of a million deaths annually uh, due to the sequelae of, of chronic hepatitis B. And again, we all know that those that have chronic hepatitis B are at risk of progression of liver disease to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And of course, someone's already mentioned, the vast majority of these people are unaware of their hepatitis B surface antigen status. And a little bit of data from Australia. In Australia, we have free testing for hepatitis B surface antigen, free testing for hepatitis B DNA. We have free treatment. Yet we estimate 40 to 50% of people are unaware of their hepatitis B surface antigen positive status. And not clearly, it's much less in the developing world. So hepatitis C, so the re most recent estimates uh, indicate 140, 184 million people uh, infected, and of course that's antibody positivity. If we draw a line through that and say roughly two thirds of those people are chronically infected, and that's fairly conservative, that means there's 120 to 130 million people with chronic persistent infection out there. And again, recently published some data that's available from the um, Global Burden of Diseases 2013 study, they estimate less than 1% of those people uh, are aware that they're infected with hepatitis C. 499 annual deaths, now you would think an epidemiologist with access to modelling, where there's always a bit of fudge, you'd just push that up a thousand, wouldn't you, to make it a neat half a million? <laughs> anyway, if we combine hepatitis C with hepatitis B, we come to 1.3 million people with viral hepatitis deaths annually. And that then makes us rank up with the biggies, HIV, TB, malaria. Now, we get lots of publicity about those, and also they get lots of funding, but viral hepatitis lagging and slowly starting to catch up. So as I say, the ninth ranked cause of uh, human death with those other diseases. And liver cancer, again from Global Burden of Diseases Study 2010, the third most common cause of cancer death globally. And in the electronically available version, and now the second uh, ranked uh, cause of death. And again, some local data from Australia, liver cancer is the fastest growing cause of cancer mortality. So hepatitis C, well, we're not going to get rid of it, I don't think, without a vaccine. So it's interesting to hear those talks earlier today. But we can cure people with hepatitis C. Uh, and the advantage with hep C is we don't have a refractory or archive genetic material like we do with hepatitis B and, and HIV. And we've got these fabulous new drugs. I'm sure we're going to hear more about them later today. And also, I dare say, a fair portion of AASLD uh, will be devoted to the subject as well. Now, the DAAs and how they're treated and the regimens that are going to be used are still evolving. There'll be some rationalisation, I'm sure, in pharma. Um, they will become pan-genotypic. At the moment, there's a bit of a fiddle which regimen you go on if you're 1A versus 1B, and genotype 3 might be a bit more difficult uh, to treat. But at, you can bet that the companies are now working on pan-genotypic um, regimens, and so that means in, in a small while, all we'll need to know is someone's hep CRNA positive, or they've got persistent infection, we won't be worrying about necessarily viral load or even genotype. We know that these eight to 12 week uh, treatments will uh, give us a cure. And again, you've all heard of anecdotal evidence where some hep C patients have only been treated for four to five weeks and still obtain a sustained viral response or, or a cure after such a short period. Pharma have promised to, develop, to, to deliver uh, low-cost treatments to some of the limited resource countries uh, at less than $1,000 per treatment. If we go from 12 weeks back to eight weeks or even earlier, that will make it even cheaper. And of course, there's generics. Again, we might hear about some of that later, which might make that price even cheaper or even half that. So fabulous drugs. We can cure hepatitis C. But the trouble is we don't know who's got hepatitis C. There's this huge bottleneck of diagnosis, and that's really what I'm going to address today. So centralised laboratories, like many of us have access to, we've got our Abbots, we've got our Roche tests, um, sophisticated equipment, uh, sensitive tests, specific tests, accredited laboratories, you can rely on the results, they've been seen by a pathologist. That doesn't apply to where most people have got hepatitis C, unfortunately, so we've got to look at other strategies, uh, decentralised um, methodologies, and there are two that spring to mind straight away. 
one's called dried blood spot testing where in fact in a decentralised or regional location we can send samples off to a centralised location. The other one's point of care testing uh, where we can do the testing on the spot. Now, Fortunately, most of these uh, tests, the dried blood spot and also point of uh, care testing, uh, rely on just finger prick blood, which has lots of advantages. So dried blood spot testing, those of you that are old enough will remember that uh, these have been around for a very long time. It started off with a guy called Robert Guthrie, who uh, was a microbiologist, and they had little Guthrie cards. I remember my first job was in haematology, and I can remember using these. We had these little glass capillary tubes, some were 10 microliter, 20 microliter, 50 microliter, they were colour coded with different marks on them. You drew up the blood and you put it onto the spot. We still use those um, today, obviously, for looking at metabolic uh, disorders, you know, newborns and hill prick bloods. And in virology, we've used them ourselves for looking for measles antibody sero surveys where blood spots are sent off for antibody testing after elution. They're becoming more and more used now for molecular testing. And I've just listed a few references there for HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, where they're used for both viral load testing and also for hepatitis um, B and C genotyping and HIV resistance testing. And some of the companies have now jumped on board. Uh, Kygen, which make little extraction kits, um, usually spin column based. Uh, they've got a protocol in their, in their um, handbook for uh, eluting material off uh, dried blood spots. The Abbott M2000, which is an extraction instrument used in HIV, Hep B, Hep C, Chlamydia, Neisseria, Gonorrhea, for those sorts of tests, have got a, a protocol you can use for eluting material, uh, genetic material. And the Hologic Panther also have a fully automated system for using with dried blood spot testing. So we're starting to see a bit of uh, momentum in the dried blood spot area. So let's just talk briefly about the advantages and disadvantages. Well, minimal invasiveness, because you can use a finger prick, really important for example, young children and, and babies, or for example, injecting drug users where uh, you know, venous access is, is, is difficult. A very small volume required, usually 50 microliters or so. Specialised equipment, don't need centrifuges. Um, again, just a, a tube and a set amount. Ease of storage, don't need dry ice. You can send samples off, don't even need um, a cold pack to send them off to a centralised laboratory. The biggest drawback, of course, is the lack of uh, sensitivity. So there's a real payback in using dried blood spots as the sensitivity of the samples reduced substantially, which is also to do with the volume that you're using. Um, if you're using DNA or RNA, there is now some information that uh, you probably do require storage at uh, minus 20 degrees over any, anything more than a week or so. And again, the whole thing isn't completely standardised. We don't have standardised protocols for treating dried blood spots. Okay, so let's move on to point of care testing. What does it really mean? What's the definition? Well, it means testing near or where the patient is. Um, quick result turnaround. That means the patient's there to counsel, uh, you don't lose your patient to follow up and importantly, and I, again it will come up later, you know, we have a result that it's going to help patient care. Um, so of course everybody thinks of point of care testing as being useful in remote and regional areas where we again don't have access to centralised laboratories, but it can also be useful in developed countries or well resourced countries where we have um, disenfranchised high risk populations who aren't going to seek medical help through conventional channels uh, and again uh, not for Hep B or Hep C, but in Melbourne we have one um, for HIV testing and we've picked up a number of new cases of HIV infection but, and these people would not have gone to a standard medical uh, clinic. So th even in countries where you do have the resources, this point of care testing can be useful. So point of care testing, WHO have set some guidelines. Uh, they were originally developed for um, point of care testing for sexually transmitted infection and they're called ASSURED, that is that, so it's an acronym. A for affordable, S for sensitivity, S for specific, U for user friendly, R for rapid, actually it's rapid and robust, but if you put two R's in a short, it means you spell it incorrectly. Uh, equipment free and D for delivery. And the last one's delivery to the end user. And that's the really important thing because the WHO mantra is, is screening is linked to care. We don't want to turn a person into a patient if we can't offer them something. So point of care tests are really divided into two groups. There's the lateral flow um, uh, immunoassays or immunochromatography. And the other group of devices are like mini benchtop or miniaturised benchtop, which do have some sophistication to them using microfluidics. So lateral flow immunoassays have been around for a very long time. Um, probably 
you know, for 20 years or so there was very little progress, but just in the last few years we've really seen um, people jumping on board and trying to improve these assays. The most common point of care test is usually uh, just a simple capture format, um, and in infectious diseases, uh, mostly used for antibody detection, but of course it can be used for surface antigen detection for hepatitis B, for example. And usually you just get a, a little purple line indicating a, so a, a visual readout saying if someone's positive or negative. In the old days there was no QC with that, but now nearly all the tests have a little line to indicate that the uh, apparatuses and the reagents are working appropriately. And there's even more, uh, shall we say, well-engineered uh, point-of-care lateral flow devices which are linked to fluorescence or scattered light or luminescence which give you a signal amplification and give you a more accurate readout. The drawbacks of these uh, lateral flow assays is that there's what they call a large coefficient of variation. This is sort of science talk for meaning lack of reproducibility, trying to hide it. Um, reduced sensitivity again and um, the inability to do multiple analytes. Uh, on, so you would need more than one strip to measure more than one analyte. So talking about um, anti-HCV, there's an interesting review recently published in PLOS One. It's, I've got uh, Carew by three to the power of three there. That's because the authors are Carew, Carew and Carew. Um, and they did a big meta-analysis. They looked at 30 anti, uh, antibody tests uh, for hepatitis C. So there's quite a few out there to choose from. Um, several of those have the CE mark, which is a little easier to attain. One has an FDA approval, which is the Oroquic Rapid Antibody Test. Um, about a third of those assays were rubbish, according to the review. Um, the Oroquic had the highest sensitivity and specificity. In fact, it rivalled some of the enzyme immunoassay-based assays that are run on typical laboratory platforms. Um, it's also the most expensive of all the point-of-care tests. And here's an example of the results. So we can see um, uh, the control line, which I talked about, so quality control of the reagents there. So the first one showing a negative result where the T for test, nothing has come up there. The R, uh, meaning uh, you've had a reactive result and then an invalid assay, which means the reagents have gone off, there's been inappropriate sample used. Um, the Oroquics also work on uh, saliva, but I'm just really talking about it's a FDA approvals for venous blood and also for finger prick blood. So here we already have a good test for detecting antibody that's uh, commercially available and FDA approved. So let's talk about core antigen. So hepatitis C core antigen testing is available. The first tests appeared probably close to 15 years ago. The one I'm familiar with in Australia was marketed through ortho. Um, and I, I think it might have been even then an Abbott Laboratory product. Um, Abbott Laboratories now have improved that assay uh, and it's a chemiluminescent microparticle based enzyme immunoassay. So it's run on an Abbott architect, which most laboratories uh, would have, but again, you need a central laboratory to run the assay. It's got a lot of advantages in that a positive antibody test that can be reflexed and look for core antigen. So it's been used as an alternative to the molecular based PCR um, assays. It's a lower cost, although I would say in Australia it's not a substantially lower cost. They really make a bit of a killing on it. Um, faster turnaround, um, but it has a reduced sensitivity and I'll show you some data there. So I think this has got great potential to be developed as a POC and I'm not the only one that thinks that. Obviously other people are also thinking this. So this is some very old data here. This is using um, BDNA and in the blue lines there is actually viral load data that we generated from our laboratories almost 10 years ago, 4,000. So quite big numbers. Uh, the BDNA viral load assay um, had a limit of detection of around about 500 international units. So here I've mapped it and you can see the average viral load somewhere around about half a million international units and where that green line is is the cut off the, of the core antigen assay when we measure it against the molecular assay. So somewhere around about two or three thousand international units varying depending on the genotype of the virus. So if we look at the number of people that we would miss by screening with the core antigen assay, you can see it's a very small amount. Some papers say it would be 10%. Our data would suggest it's even less, perhaps only 5%. But you would miss some people using a core antigen assay as a point of care test. Now, at least till the last week or so, I, I wasn't aware of any point of care test using core antigen. However, the wheels are moving or as we say in Australia, there was movement at the station. Uh, so Dactari, I think if you, you probably can't read it there, but they've entered into a partnership with Merck to develop a core antigen point of care assay. 
And because I was in Canada, I thought I would throw in a, a local one. It actually hasn't been developed for core antigen, but this is a chip care device developed by, I think it's a spin-off company um, of the University of Toronto. And this is a CD, used for CD4 counts. It's a handheld device. Uh, uh, it relies on batteries for power. Um, it's a finger prick sample that can be used. And I see the Canadian government has given money very recently, two or three million Canadian dollars towards developing this particular device for HIV testing. So something like that would be ideal then to go and develop for core antigen testing. This particular device uses, um, you know, it's got a, 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 a d enhanced detection system, so it's not relying, relying on a visual readout. It's using um, absorption of some description and the data can be downloaded onto an iPhone or by Wi-Fi to another device. So lots of advantages, and as I say, it's going to be developed for HIV testing, so wouldn't it be great if we could develop something like that also for core antigen testing locally? So let's move on to the last class. This is the sort of the bench toppy type ones, microfluidics, and probably the, the major players in this field are the gene expert, and also there's an ALIR device. So the ALIR device, uses um, loop amplification uh, or, or loop mediated isothermal amplification. Uh, and the advantage of this particular device is it doesn't require refrigeration or heating, it's isothermal, so the only, um, it just uses a fan, so quite a simple device, but I haven't really seen much about its use. The um, gene expert has been used extensively for DNA and RNA testing, so it's used for MRSA, um, Clostridium difficile, um, uh, I think in the USA it's got an FDA waiver that it can be used in a, in a doctor's surgery, for example, for doing influenza virus um, testing by molecular means. They have developed an, uh, an HIV test. There are lots of these instruments around in the developing world. They've been sponsored around by governments and NGOs. There's something like between 500 and 1,000 of these instruments out there on projects looking at um, resistant uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So the possibility there is throwing something like hepatitis C onto it. And I believe they have developed a hepatitis C test, but I'm not sure where it is in terms of the regulatory environment. So none of these really meet the assured criteria on because, let's face it, this is a little benchtop PCR machine. It's probably going to require venous blood, so you're going to have to have a centrifuge to be able to spin. It's going to require power, which can be supplied, I believe, by a car battery. Um, it takes about 90 minutes, somewhere between an hour and two hours to get the result, but let's face it, we wait in the doctor's room that long anyway. Um, uh, and one would imagine this device would require maintenance and would require calibration. So I don't think it really meets our criterion at the moment for a great point of care device of falling in with the assured um, uh, uh, guidelines. Now, so far I've given you a barmaid talk. So this little bit's non-barmaid. Um, sorry, Kim. Um, and it's a little experiment we're doing uh, a collaboration between the School of Chemistry at Monash University, which is one of the local universities in, in, um, in my si home city, Melbourne. And I'm not going to go into the detail of it for two reasons. It would take too long, and the second part is I don't really understand it. But it relies on, um, what's it called, attenuated total reflection. So if I can just show you uh, here. So using this little device here, which is a little platform, it's actually made of diamond, but you know, synthetic diamond, unfortunately, but still be worth a lot of money. That's hit by infrared light, and you have your sample on top of it, which might only be one to five microliters of blood. And then you get this diffraction pattern, and the diffraction pattern uh, is picked up uh, by the instrument, and it can tell the difference between different glycoproteins, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Um, and so when we've tried this device uh, against blood samples which were HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, he, the um, Baden Wood, who is the hold patents on this sort of technology, he can distinguish between HIV and hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And in fact, if we just take hepatitis B and hepatitis C, he has the ability for differentiating between those two things as well. So this is just thinking outside the square rather than just lateral flow. There are other technologies out there which might be applicable to point of care testing. And I think we're gonna see a lot of changes over the next five years or maybe decade. So the last little bit I'm going to talk about hepatitis B cure. So hepatitis C, you can see there's the potential at least for some really good devices whereby we're going to have an algorithm where we can go and do antibody testing, we can do maybe core antigen testing, maybe even a molecular test and potentially give out these new DAAs. Maybe we don't even need to do a follow-up test. 
you know, the real world suggests 90% cure rates. Maybe we just walk away and we don't do a follow-up test. That means we might be confining to one visit of the person to a, to a, um, a remote clinic or whatever. So CCC DNA hepatitis B, I've spent half my life working on it. Um, very difficult to eliminate. It's probably the cause of reactivation. It's possibly the cause of hepatitis B chronicity. We also can have hep integrated hepatitis B DNA. So hep B cure really comes from preventing it in the first place, vaccination. And Alex gave a really good talk on that earlier. So we fall back on what is a hepatitis, hepatitis B cure. We talk about a functional cure. Pharma talks about hepatitis S antigen loss and the scientists talk about seroconversion as a functional cure. So point of care tests for hepatitis B, there are lots out there for lateral flow technologies looking for nearly all the hepatitis B markers. There must be at least a dozen of them and they're all uh, relatively good quality. We know from the reveal data uh, from Taiwan about the importance of hepatitis B and there's a biological gradient of viral load associated with the development of cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. So really hep B DNA testing would be the ultimate point of care test for looking at patients at risk. But if we look at, um, we did an evaluation of a hepatitis uh, B surface antigen lateral flow strip in collaboration with um, Bob Gish. Um, the collaboration was Bob bought the strips and we did all the work. Anyway, um, so if you look here on the left hand side, we've got the hep B genotypes because we've got a wonderful um, uh, repository of interesting hepatitis B. So genotypes A, B, C, D, E, F and G. And across we've got the, um, the strips and I've just taken a picture of the strip which has on the right hand side, it has the quality control strip. And then we've diluted uh, the amount of serum uh, out to get an endpoint. And what we find by doing this is in international units is these strips are quite capable of picking up somewhere between 10 and 20 international units of surface antigen, irrespective of the genotype. Now here I've got a little picture. So we do quantification of hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, we're one of the t alpha and beta testing sites for the, the Roche assay. And here I've drawn a black line of the cutoff of the um, point of care lateral flow strip for hepatitis B service engine. So you can see if we use that strip really we're going to pick up 99% or thereabouts of people who are surface antigen positive by doing that. So what does that tell us without anything else? Well, we can't, we're not really talking about uh, linking it to care but we can have what's known as an actionable response in WHO uh, parlance. So it's the opportunity of finding someone surface antigen positive, we can give them, talk to them, counsel them about infectivity. Um, we can look at their partners, we can look at their children, we can look at their parents. Um, we can reduce maternal transmission by uh, e emphasising the importance of, um, uh, that, of that first uh, birth dose of hepatitis B vaccine. We know surface antigen, particularly if it's uh, something that's been there for some time, the importance of liver disease progression. And importantly, it's been used quite a lot by governments, NGOs, WHO for zero surveys. So going in and looking at hepatitis B surface antigen prevalence, which then can be used as a guide for directing health and vaccine policies. Now, it wouldn't be so hard as an extension of hepatitis B surface antigen lateral flow to do quantification. I've already shown how you can do it by just uh, dilutions. And there are some data that we can glean from the quantification of surface antigen. So, and Henry Chan's the expert of it if he's here somewhere. High levels in E antigen might be an indication of immunotolerant. Low levels in E antigen positive women usually indicates a low viral load. And that means that they have the normal vaccination for the baby, then the chances of them getting hepatitis B is extremely low. If you have a very high viral load, there is some chance that the, the baby can still be infected. Low levels in E antigen negative uh, indicates low risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And of course, we all know the data about on treatment, using it as a biomarker for on treatment response for interferon, but that's probably not something that's gonna be helpful in the um, low and middle income countries. So again, I'm talking to the converted here about the landscape uh, for hepatitis B. We can control hepatitis B by using nucleoside analogues, but seroconversion is extremely rare. I'm not gonna talk about the politics of that if you're HIV infected with hepatitis B, you can get tenofovir for nothing, but if you're mono infected, you can't get tenofovir cheaply. But remember, and again, we'll hopefully hear some of this later today, now that we're on top of hepatitis C in terms of um, drugs, not in terms of diagnosis, there's a lot of momentum switching to the little Cinderella virus, hepatitis B, uh, and these are just some of the drugs that are being investigated as uh, potential um, antiviral agents. 
and already there has been a group got together, the International Coalition for Eradication of HBV or ICE HBV. ICE has a different connotation in Australia. Um, so there's a coalition for trying to get together and, and uh, finally get rid of hepatitis B around the world. And in the interests of time, uh, that's all I'll talk about, but questions, as I say, will take later. And this is my opportunity to escape. Thank you very much. Yeah.